distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and in this audience above all, I can say dear friends. Uh, it's a very great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I am conscious that this is the last session before lunch. I'm also conscious that the disadvantage of being the last speaker is that everybody else has said everything you want to say before. Uh, I haven't been here all morning, but just listening for the last 10 minutes tells me that that's likely to be true. The uh, uh, Trade Development Council is something that I've been involved with for a number of years now, obviously with my previous hat on. I am now just a retired banker. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited back as a retired banker. Uh, it is a clear, clearly a pleasure to be back in my new capacity, and one of the delights about my new role is the way in which it allows me to continue to be involved, or requires me to continue to be involved with China in general and Hong Kong in particular. Uh, so when I say it's a pleasure to be back, it is not just because of the old friendships, but because Hong Kong uh, isn't just an old friend to the UK, it is a thriving and dynamic partner with a unique position in Asia. Uh, it's unique because, firstly, it's important in its own right as a major economy. Secondly, because it is, of course, a unique gateway to the mainland. Thirdly, because it is a major Asian international financial and services centre, not merely for the region, but as part, fourthly, of that network of major financial and services centres that extends around the world and is vital to underpinning today's global economy and of which London is, of course, another key member. So there are a whole variety of reasons why uh, it is good to be talking about the, on the opportunities that exist in the developing UK-Hong Kong relationship in the 21st century. Indeed, as far as the UK is concerned, and my brief nowadays is for UK's trade performance and its investment position in the world, uh, it is very clear that the Hong Kong relationship is important both in its own right and as gateway to the mainland and as regional base for Asia. It's important to us because we in this country have got a job of work to do. You know this, you don't need me to tell you, uh, that we need to find new sources of growth in the wake of the financial crisis. We need to find new sources of growth that are more internationally oriented. This economy can't go on growing the way it was before with the growth being driven by consumption fueled by debt and by government spending. The economics textbooks tell you there's only one other way of doing that or two other ways of doing that, better investment performance and above all a better trade performance. So we need to look outwards and engage effectively and competitively with the world at large. And given what's going on in the world at large, this turns our eyes inevitably towards Asia and to Hong Kong, a place which we have so many long-standing associations with. Michael said it just now, go east uh, th there was that famous phrase, of course, from the 19th century, go west, young man. I think the, e the 21st century equivalent of this is go east, young person, just to update it <laughs> suitably. And the statistics are there for us all to see. Hong Kong is one of the largest sources of foreign direct investment in the whole of Asia. It's the third largest recipient of foreign direct investment in Asia. Its economy, which grew by 7% last year, is forecast to grow by 6% this year. The city attracted 36 million visitors last year, more than five times the size of the local population. It is quite clearly becoming, or is, one of that small number of cities which can properly be described as world cities. Its economic strengths are by now legendary. Its internationalism its entrepreneurialism, its flexibility and its adaptability. We forget that it isn't all that long ago that Hong Kong's economic face to the world was cheap plastic goods and textiles. How things have changed and it's not all that long ago. So the flexibility and the adaptability are crucial to Hong Kong's success. So is the legal system based on English common law. So is intellectual property protection. So is a skilled workforce, freedom of information, freedom for travel, and of course, long-term investment in the public infrastructure of Hong Kong in a way which, frankly, Britain needs to learn a lot from uh, for the way in which 
Hong Kong is consistently upgrading uh, its economic and public infrastructure. Its educational institutions are world-class in many ways. Its creativity uh, manifests, of course, in the film industry, which is showcasing its capabilities here in London this week, and a burgeoning cultural life in Hong Kong. I lived in Hong Kong in the 1980s and early 90s. It was a great place to live, but if I was absolutely honest, it was a bit monochrome too. Well, that's no longer the case. This is, as I say, becoming, or is already, one of the world's world cities. It is also, of course, on the doorstep of the world's most extraordinary country in terms of economic and social transformation taking place before our eyes. Indeed, I say on the doorstep of a country, and that's, a, that's not what I should have said. It's on the doorstep of a market. It is part of a country which is changing itself so radically and so rapidly and whose, the impact of whose change is going to be the biggest fact about the 21st half, at least, of the 21st century. Hong Kong's economic links to the Chinese mainland are deep and varied, increasingly deep, increasingly varied. Mainland visitors now account for one in five of all retail sales in Hong Kong, 50% of all luxury goods sales, and in 10 years' time, I read, it is projected that the mainland will account for 80% of all luxury goods sales in Hong Kong. The Mainland and Hong Kong Closer Economic Partnership Agreement, the CPA, the free trade agreement that grants easier access to mainland markets from Hong Kong has now been in operation since 2004 and provides a valuable opportunity to access the mainland in a simpler way than going directly there, even for companies that do not have an office in Hong Kong. Beyond China, Hong Kong is also, of course, the perfect launch pad for the wider region. It is no coincidence that there are estimated to be over 3,600 regional headquarters and offices in Hong Kong, including those, by the way, of at least 300 British companies. In this role as gateway to the wider region, what is interesting to me about Hong Kong is that it's in a way similar for all the very obvious differences to that of the UK, which is a great gateway to the wider European market. Indeed, there are many crossovers with the UK economy, which show, by the way, the opportunities that exist for British companies. Both the UK and Hong Kong have a strong financial services sector. And the development of the offshore market for trade in the renminbi is, I believe, in years to come, something that will be a very exciting thing that ties, uh, uh, strengthens those ties that already exist between Hong Kong and London. Both. Hong Kong and the UK have flourishing sectors in new industries such as biotechnology and renewable energy. Both have vibrant creative industries. As I've already mentioned, the Hong Kong Film Week is testimony to the vibrancy of what is actually a long-standing creative industry in Hong Kong. Both economies have a commitment to removing the barriers to entrepreneurialism. I think it might be true to say that the UK has further to go in this than Hong Kong, but the direction of the intent is absolutely clear. And by the way, it is reflected in the fact that the Heritage Foundation recently named Hong Kong as the world's freest economy, and the World Trade Organization listed the UK as the most open and business-oriented economy in Europe, and the World Bank listed the UK as top of the European League for ease of doing business. So whilst we can never be complacent, and we may well think that the glass is only half full, nevertheless, I think we have some things in common and we, the Brits, have some things that we can learn. So Hong Kong's strengths as a trading partner are clear, and the opportunities, therefore, are also clear. There are exciting opportunities for large companies through, for example, the high-value infrastructure projects such as the West Kowloon Cultural Development Project and Kai Tak. There are also numerous opportunities for British smaller and medium-sized companies. Take, for example, a company such as Hampshire-based Berry, Bross and Rudd, known to some of us very well, of course, as a purveyor of fine wines and spirits. It started trading in Hong Kong just over 10 years ago. In that time, their Hong Kong operation has gone from zero to now accounting for nearly half of their global market share. And their Hong Kong sales are growing by 15% year on year. I mentioned them as an example of an SME because actually for the British, it's 
encouraging and supporting more and more smaller businesses to get involved internationally that is key to our national challenge of improving our trade position and finding a new pathway of growth. And I happen to believe that there are all sorts of kinds of SME that should be thinking about the opportunities in a place like Hong Kong. And the following story is designed, I hope, just to broaden our horizons. This is a true story. Uh, this comes from uh, UK Trade and Investments, regional director in this country for the Northwest, a chap by the name of Clive Drinkwater. Uh, some of you may know him well. He's a, a, a bundle of energy and dynamism, does a great deal for the cause of British exporting in the Northwest. And Clive was visiting his barber in Liverpool um, over the years, and he got to talking to his barber, as one sometimes does in a barber shop. And this barber is a person who, in his spare time, specializes in a thing called trichology. This is not a word I had heard of until I heard this story, but trichology has to do with uh, um, scalp health. And he has designed a number of uh, lotions and potions for improving scalp health. Uh, that's what he does in his spare time. And Clive said to him, have you ever thought of exporting? And the barber said, no, no, I'm just a Liverpool barber. Don't be uh, silly. And Clive said, well, do you mind if I call a friend in Hong Kong? So he said, no. And so Clive called his friend in Hong Kong, and the friend in Hong Kong said, hmm, don't know, might be. Why doesn't he send over a sample or two of his product? This was a few years ago. And now, as a useful sideline to haircutting in Liverpool, he is sending a pallet or two of his specialist products to Hong Kong to a distributor every year. It's amazing what you can do. Hong Kong is also, of course, a base for the mainland market. And we know about the extraordinary opportunities there. I believe that the long-standing relationship between Hong Kong and the UK gives the UK an advantage in thinking about Hong Kong as a gateway into the mainland. We do stand alongside Germany as the largest European investor in China in cumulative terms. And such is the influence of our trade on the mainland that in 2009, it is interesting to note that we sold about a million dollars of tea to China. We really do need to think quite broadly about the kinds of things that we can do. And importantly and seriously, think of Hong Kong as a great base, a great access point for the mainland, as well as, of course, for the wider region. Just a few words about the relationship in the other direction. Uh, that is uh, the relationship of inward investment from Hong Kong into this country. This is something that's the other part of my brief. It is clearly in the interest of this country to be as attractive a place as we can for foreign direct investment. We have a reasonably good story, by the way, in terms of our uh, record of attracting foreign direct investment into this country. And I am, of course, pleased to report that some of the most prominent investments in this country come from Hong Kong. To name but one whom you all know, of course, Chung Kong, prominent in this country in ports, in resources, in telecommunications, in retail, and also through their foundation in having very recently, I attended it, established or opened the London presence of the Chung Kong Graduate Business School, a particularly interesting venture because that brings together what is a Beijing establishment with a Hong Kong founder and supporter and the London opportunity. But it's not only the big names that we know about. There's a company called CN Innovations Holdings, a Hong Kong subsidiary in this country. CN Innovations started out in the watch manufacturing business, but has now branched out into bioengineering, thanks to a new venture that it has started with Oxford University. The company has found a way of tapping into UK expertise and invested in a project to commercialize microbioreactor technology don't ask me exactly what that is, that could really improve drug discovery and stem cell culture. So all the way across the spectrum, the way in which the UK and Hong Kong are partnering in commercial development opportunities and investment is becoming more and more sophisticated. We need to do our part, of course, in terms of attracting inward investment and making sure we continue to be an attractive location for Hong Kongers. Uh, and indeed, 
We have been working to ensure that the business tax environment here is as favourable as we can make it and as competitive as we can make it. Uh, we continue to work away at the regulatory challenge. Um, I have to say uh, that uh, though there is a clear government commitment and I think signs of progress on reducing the amount of regulation in this country, I have to admit that if I were standing here in 10 years' time, I'd still be saying this is an important challenge. It's slow, hard, detailed grind. Uh, but what I can promise you is that we're committed to doing it and doing the best we can. And then finally, and this picks up on one of the questions that I heard being asked just now, how do we help companies to take the risk, get out of their comfort zone, look at new opportunities, uh, and in particular, in, uh, since we're talking about Hong Kong as gateway to Asia, how can we help Hong, uh, companies in this country look at the Hong Kong opportunity? This is where the organization, or one of the organizations I'm responsible for, the UK Trade and Investment, come in. I've already referred to their regional director in the Northwest and his innovative dynamism. But it is our job to be there for companies that decide they want to take the plunge, help them find their way forward, find the solutions, work with sources of finance so that we can help them take the plunge into the international domain. And I have to say that as far as I'm concerned, I can think of no better place for them to be looking at very closely as an opportunity than Hong Kong. We have an excellent team in the British Consulate General in Hong Kong. I was there earlier this year. I have met uh, a, the people involved. Uh, Andrew Seaton, the Consul General, and Stephen Cartwright, the Trade Commissioner, are both here today, both keen to talk to as many people as possible. This is a marketing opportunity, you see. Uh, anything that we can do to help encourage and strengthen and broaden those links between the UK business and Hong Kong is in my view, going to play a key role in that overall UK objective of more effective engagement internationally. So the message from this symposium is clear. Hong Kong and UK have some interesting things in common despite all the very obvious differences. And we have a large history of warm relationships to build on and we have the extraordinary opportunity that comes from a world that is continuing to globalise for all of its current difficulties and a world in which the centre of gravity is continuing to shift eastwards for all of the current changes. And in particular, for the UK to have this relationship with Hong Kong, which is a gateway to the mainland and an extraordinary regional base for Asia, is one of our competitive advantages. Thank you very much.